Man, it's already Sunday again. What's going on, guys? Great Disciple back with another Church for Gamers. And I know I have some new subscribers, as I do each and every week, and I was just recently on TSG. So if you're new to the channel, let me kind of explain what's going on here. Um, about 10 or 12 weeks back, I started a series on Sunday. Some people call them spiritual series, spiritual Sunday series. Mine's called Church for Gamers. Um, I chose a book of the Bible, the book of Ecclesiastes, and each week I go through a chapter. And in this episode, we're going to be going through chapter 10 of Ecclesiastes. If it's not your cup of tea, just click off the video and I'll see you tomorrow on Monday, which is another one of my series called Gray's Mail, which I'm sure you're going to like that episode. It's a good one. But if you're interested in hearing maybe what the Bible has to say to you today, then tune in because this is a great lesson for everyone. I chose the book of Ecclesiastes because it's a book of wisdom, wisdom that can be applied for anybody. Now, as a Christian, we believe that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, in chapter 10, there is one verse specifically that I want to start with. Normally, I'll start with, you know, verse one and we'll just carry on through there. But this verse, and it's going to sound really interesting when I say it to you, kind of sums up the entire chapter, almost sums up the entire book of Ecclesiastes, let alone the entire Bible. Here it is. It's, it's verse 11. It says, if the serpent bites before being charmed, there is no profit for the charmer. Let me say that one more time. If the serpent bites before being charmed, there is no profit for the charmer. Now, in biblical times, there were snake charmers. And I know there's still snake charmers today. The idea is this, is you have this, this well-trained, practiced snake charmer. And this is his career. This is what he does for a living. And if he gets bitten by the snake, what was all that training and practice worth? Or, or let, let me say it a different way. If wisdom isn't used, if it isn't applied, then what's it worth? What does it matter? You know, in, in the Bible, in the book of James, chapter one, verse 22, it says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself, do what it says. The Bible just isn't about gaining knowledge, it's about application. You know, the last thing that Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew chapter 28 was, therefore go meaning that there is action in the faith. It's not enough just to listen and believe, but there is action, there is movement. Therefore, go, go and do what? Make, there's creation with your hands. Therefore, go and make, make what? Disciples, people who understand what you understand. And where do I go? To all nations, to everyone. That's the Christian faith is you've got to go forth and you've got to share the word of God. I mean, there's so many examples of this. I mean, take a football game, for example. I love this. You know, in church in general, you know, let's say church is 100%, right? Only about 10 to 15% of the people who attend church actually do anything. You know, those are the ones who serve in the children's ministry. Those are the ones who lead the, the music. Those are the ones who go on the mission trips. Those are the ones who give money. The other 90, 85% of the people, they just show up, listen, and leave. Basically dead believers. Uh, uh, let's put it in uh, in a sports term. You guys go to a football game, you watch football games, or you watch soccer games, whatever you want to call them. And what do you have? You have 60 to 100,000 people who never work out sitting in the stands watching 40, 50 guys on a field who work out too much. That's the church for you. That's the Christian faith. Few doing the majority of the work while the majority do none of the work. How's that? Or, or here you go, I want you to watch this little clip from Francis Chan. Look, when, when, when my daughter comes to me and I say, hey, go, go clean your room, she knows better. She, she's not gonna come back a couple hours later and say, hey, dad, I memorized what you said to me. He said, go clean your room. You know, what am I gonna say? Oh, good job, that's what I wanted. No, and, and she's not gonna come to me and say, dad, I can say, go clean your room in Greek, listen. That's not gonna fly, and, and what if she says, you know what? My friends and I, we're gonna gather together and every week we're gonna have a study and we're gonna figure out what it would look like if I cleaned my room. <laughs> no, none of that's gonna fly. Just go and clean it, she knows that. So why do we think that this type of thinking or this type of talk is gonna work with Jesus? I mean, Jesus was as black and white as you get. He would look at people and he'd say, why do you call me Lord? when you don't do what I say. He says that in Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord 
when you don't do what I ask you to do? I mean, why would you call someone your master and then not listen to him? And, and he says in Matthew 7, 21, he goes, listen, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is gonna enter the kingdom of heaven. It's only the one who actually does the will of my Father who is in heaven. You gotta love his example. You know, talking to his daughter about cleaning her room. It's kind of like, like the Bible, like God telling us, like, I've given you this wisdom. Now go apply it to your life and go share it with other people. I don't want you to, to explain to me what I've already said to you. I don't need you to gather and talk about my word and what it could possibly mean. I don't need translations of what I'm trying to say. I just need action. You know, it was said before that if you had one guy who had memorized the entire Bible versus one guy who had the ability to live his life based on one verse completely and utterly for God, the guy who would live his life by one verse was worth more than the guy who knew every single word in the Bible. And it's true. Action speaks louder than words. We've all heard that statement, right? Okay, so let's go to verse 1 of chapter 10. This is a, a good way of viewing this is Solomon is giving a message to the human race okay it's uh he's pleading with us to be wise as we enjoy our life and our families and our work so here we go verse one dead flies make a perfumer's oil stink so a little foolishness is weightier than wisdom and honor a wise man's heart directs him towards the right but the foolish man's heart directs him towards the left even when the fool walks along the road his sense is lacking and he demonstrates to everyone that he is a fool. So what does that mean? Back in biblical times, a perfumer skill was very intricate and specific. He would spend days, if not weeks, concocting this liquid of perfume and one fly could ruin all of his work. Just like one foolish act can destroy a lifetime of wisdom. Or, or, let me put it to you this way. You have 10,000 Christians stand up and testify to the power of the Word of God, but one idiot, one fool can offer pornography and the people will flock to the fool. I mean, think about the greatest speakers, the greatest Christian speakers you could think of, like Billy Graham or Chuck Swindoll or David Jeremiah. I mean, they, they garner audiences of, you know, 5,000, 10,000, sometimes 50,000 people. But then you have Howard Stern or um, Larry Flint or Hugh Hefner they show one piece of pornography they're willing to talk about one sex act and their audience is a million to two million to three million in the book of peter it, it says this it says in all this they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation and they malign you for it see how great a love the father has bestowed upon us that we would be called children of god and such we are for this reason the world does not know us because it did not know him so we should not be surprised you guys that the world doesn't like our wisdom all right the, the world is more inclined to follow the fool than the wise man so I guess to apply that to your life, just realize that your job is to be a great husband or a great wife and a great worker and a great father and a great mother and a great friend and a great son, but nobody's going to applaud you for it. Instead, they're going to applaud Kim Kardashian and Kanye West. They're going to put their hopes in foolish people. Oh, on a quick note, in the verse it says, a wise man's heart directs him towards the right, but the foolish man's heart directs him towards the left. Now, in biblical times, and even now, the right is always considered the dominant side. The right hand was usually your sword hands. It's the hand that most men shake with. There, there's a verse in the Bible, David said in Psalms, he said, He is my right hand, I will not be shaken. Whereas the left hand was always considered the place of weakness. That's why you hear people say the term, I'll beat you left-handed, meaning that with my weakness, I will still beat you. That's where that, that term comes from, by the way. So when it's all said and done, the wise man will end up strong, skilled, and successful, but the fool will end up weak, unskilled, and a failure. But remember, we all get to the same end. All right, let's, uh, let's continue on. It says in verse 4, If the ruler's temper rises against you, do not abandon your position because composure allays great offenses. There is an evil I have seen under the sun like an arrow which goes forth from the ruler. Folly is set in many exalted places while rich men sit in humble places. I have seen slaves riding on horses and princes walking like slaves in the land. You guys, sometimes in the short term, life seems to be backward and wicked men 
they get the upper hand. You know, bad guys hurt the good guys. I've spoken about that in many of the episodes that we have. And when that happens, what Solomon is saying is that you guys have to hold fast to your position. Just look at what's going on in the news right now. Fools often end up in the positions of authority. And there's really nothing that we can do about it. But always remember that God's in control. You know, Proverbs 21.1, the king's heart is like channels of water in the hands of the Lord. He turns it whichever way he wishes. It's just amazing. You know, when looking at this verse and, you know, trying to find an example for you guys, you can look at athletes, you can look at movie stars. I mean, you see these people and they, they end up rich, these idiots, these foolish people, you know, they... Do you see these kids come out of high school and college with little education that can barely hold or, or use the English language and they get they sign these multi-million dollar contracts with these sports teams, whether it's baseball, basketball, or football, and then you just watch their lives cave in on themselves. You know, the money takes over and then the drug use and the promiscuity with women. You see it with movie stars, like child actors. They get famous really, really early on in life and they cannot control the fame. They're just dumb and and you know most of us you know we look at these people we're like man if i could just sit down with that person and talk to them i could help them so much but you just see foolish people getting rich while the righteous people stand by just in amazement just always 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 remember that it's better to be a godly man than it is to be a rich man okay because we all end up in the same place and wealth does not buy you security all right let me continue on here it says he who, and this is verse eight, he who digs a pit may fall into it and a serpent may bite him who breaks through a wall. He who quarries stones may be hurt by them and he who splits logs may be endangered by them. If the ax is dull and he does not sharpen its edge, then he must exert more strength. Wisdom has the advantage of giving success. The edge is the key word in this, okay? So what is he talking about? He, he's talking about just being careful and avoiding the perils of your own work, all right? Because every single type of, of career out there has its, its pitfalls. But wisdom gives you the edge. Even though evil has the upper hand sometimes, stay true to wisdom. I'll give you an example of the edge. Look at Bill Belichick, the coach of the Patriots. We all follow football for the most part in America. Bill Belichick, his number one quarterback, Tom Brady, is excused from the team because of the whole deflation of the footballs. Then he comes in with his backup quarterback and he dominates. Backup quarterback gets hurt. Here comes the third string quarterback and and they dominate with him. There's always an edge and Bill Belichick is a master at finding that edge. He, He watches tapes of the other team, their offense, their defense. He knows how to game plan and that's how you live your life and that's what wisdom does for you. It gives you that edge in life, that understanding, that contentment in life. The uh, ability to take a bad situation, understand it, see through it, and continue on your path. I'm sitting here saying that to you guys, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, you know what? That's so true. If you're able to look at a bad situation, and you can apply God's word to it and understand that he's ultimately in control, it was his providence and sovereignty that put you in the position. I mean, I've said it before that God will sometimes sign you up for classes that you would never sign up for. You know, nobody wants to go through cancer 101. Nobody wants to go through divorce 101. Nobody wants to go through my child gets leukemia at the age of six 101. But God will sign you up for classes. But knowing that he's in control and he puts you there for a reason gives you an edge as you walk through that conflict in life. It doesn't matter, you guys, how handsome you are, how talented you are, how much your inheritance is. If you don't understand wisdom, you won't ultimately have the edge in life. It's all about the wisdom of God. And then we get to verse 11, which we've talked about. If the serpent bites before being charmed, there is no profit for the charmer. If God gives you the wisdom, if God gives you his word and you read it, but you choose not to apply it to your life, then what's the point? What's the point of even taking the time? What's the point of watching the Church for Gamers series if you guys are not going to apply it to your life? I'm giving you pearls here, Charlie. Do you guys remember that from Sin of a Woman when Al Pacino's talking to the boy and he's like, I'm giving you pearls here. You've got to want to apply them to your life. So the important thing is not just that you have the knowledge, but that you actually use it in your marriage and in your parenting and in your job. You have to use the wisdom given to you. All right, let's go to verse 12. It says, words from the mouth of a wise man are gracious. 
While the lips of a fool consume him, the beginning of his talking is folly, and the end of it is wicked madness. Think about that one, wicked madness. Yet the fool multiplies words. No man knows what will happen, and who can tell him what will happen after him? That's verses 12 through 14. Now, I don't have to say too much to this. You know, understand that people may not agree with you, but the wise people are always gracious. You can see this, go to any of the comment sections of my videos. I'm usually very calm and collected. I think about what I'm gonna say before I say it. And when people comment to me, I read what they say and I reply back in as wise and as calm a manner as possible. But you see the fools. The fools multiply words. They think because they say the same thing 15 times in one comment that it puts their foolish thought better forward. But it doesn't work that way. Fools multiply words. They ramble on, but yet they say nothing. And eventually their foolishness turns to anger or what Solomon calls wicked madness. When they can't express the point that they're trying to make, they begin to yell and curse. What you people today would call being triggered. <laughs> I can't believe I just said that. Triggered, man. They get triggered. <laughs> wise people lift people up. Fools bring people down. That's the easiest way to see if somebody is wise and somebody is a fool. All right, let's go to verse 15. The toil of a fool so wearies him that he does not even know how to go to a city. <laughs> I love it. Solomon's making fun of dumb people, basically. He's saying that this person who claims to know everything about life's most important questions can't even find the next city. You know, it's like these people who talk about politics and faith in like, you know, the affairs of the people today with the homosexuality and they argue abortion and the death penalty, but they can't even find the keys to their car. All right. That's basically what he's saying. He's making fun of them. All right. Uh, verse 16. Woe to you, O land, whose king is a lad and whose princes feast in the morning. Blessed are you, O land, whose king is of nobility and whose princes eat at the appropriate time for strength and not for drunkenness. All right. What's he talking about here? This is really good. I, I like this part, especially for today's time. He's saying, woe to the country that has a king who acts like a child who can't control himself, who is controlled by his foolishness, but blessed is the land whose king is wise. The morality of our leaders is so important because they can actually direct our nation. Now, God puts the leaders into power that he wants into powers, and he judges lands through their leaders, okay? So don't, don't forget that. But civilizations are affected so much by a foolish or a wise leader and you can see that if you ever take took the time to study first and second kings first and second chronicles you can see what happens to a land when you have a good guy or a bad guy as the king and we can see it today look at north korea look at russia look at america look at england i mean you can go country by country and you can see these these people who have calm patient wise leaders versus tyrants or children like in north korea i mean the, the kids he's just a kid and it's like he throws temper tantrums. It's amazing. And the people are, are hurt because of it. All right. Um, verse 19. Men prepare a meal for enjoyment, and wine makes life merry, and money is the answer to everything. By the way, that whole statement was sarcasm. Furthermore, in your bedchamber, do not curse a king, and in your sleeping room, do not curse a rich man, for a bird of the heavens will carry the sound, and the winged creature will make the matter known. Solomon's just, he's being sarcastic here. He said, you know, these men are, are foolish children, you know, that they, they feast in the morning and they try to solve problems with pleasure. And their only answer for the hard questions of life is to do more of the foolish things that they are already doing. Okay. He's making fun of these foolish leaders, but he says to be careful here. Do not inappropriately subvert the authority of a leader. Don't start a revolution. All right. Even in our bedrooms, you shouldn't curse someone because of the things that we say will eventually get out. Okay, so hold, hold your tongue. Okay, well that, that finishes up Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Remember the point of the book was, what's the point of gaining wisdom from God if there's no application in your life thereof? You guys have got to take the lessons that are given to you and you've got to apply them to your life. Now, this isn't an overnight thing. This isn't a flick the switch and all of a sudden you're a godly person. This is a slow process. It's like slow cooking chili. It's not like you throw something in the microwave for two minutes and ding, you're done and you're ready to go. No, this is a slow cooker. 
you know, God's marinating you right now, but you have got to be open. Your heart's got to be open and so does your mind to allow God to do what he needs to do in your heart and in your life. All right. Heavenly Father, we love you and we praise you and we give you glory and honor today. We pray, Lord, that your will would be done in this earth, that you would watch over the election in America, and that you would guide the men and the women who are listening to this to follow close after you. May they live a blessed life. May they learn to apply the wisdom that is given to them. And once they apply it, Lord, may you be glorified through it. We ask all this in your heavenly and holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen.